Hello, welcome to the Nagorno Karabakh miniseries, produced by Original Post Caucasus in collaboration with Eastern Dialogue. Today we are going to talk about the Armenian diaspora and lobbying during wartime. Our guest is Mr. Eric Kopian, a political consultant and strategist with over 25 years of experience in American politics, civil net host and commentator. Eric has been living in California and the last three years he's based in Yerevan. In 1997, Eric started his own political consulting firm, EDH and Associates, specializing in general consulting, direct mail and television aspects of political campaigns. Eric, thank you very much for agreeing to share your insights on the topic. It's a pleasure. We are all aware of the huge potential that the Armenian diaspora represents. But often we, uh, Armenians from Armenia or Hayastansis, forget that their genuine motivation cannot replace the professional work of lobbyists. Is there any functioning Armenian lobby abroad, especially in the US? And if so, is it coordinated by the Armenian diaspora or by the Armenian government? Well, I mean, there's, uh, there's two aspects to this. Uh, there's advocacy and there's lobby, and they're, they're different. Advocacy is when they're community organizations or it's a grassroots type of effort in the fact that you, it's ordinary people being involved and trying to influence the government. Uh, uh, on that front, you know, the Armenians have been active, if we're talking about the United States specifically, I'm assuming that's what you mean, uh, for many, many years. Uh, they've had different levels of success. Uh, unfortunately, where we have entirely lacked is in lobbying, uh, which is far more based on money and access and not just the grassroots aspect of it. And as the American body politic itself has become more and more corrupt, and less and less responsive to the demands of ordinary people. Uh, the grassroots aspects of lobbying have really become less relevant. So it's far more, you know, who can get you into the closed doors. Uh, and that involves a lot of money. And up until recently, the Armenian government has not really even been serious about it, while the other side has been exceptionally serious about it. Since they don't have any grassroots uh, influence, uh, they've actively worked on working with different lobbies, spending a lot of money, and we've seen this in Europe also. But I think it was a couple of months or a couple of weeks before the war where the Armenian government officially hired a lobbyist, and it was the firm that's tied to, you know, sent former, former Senator Bob Dole, a presidential candidate, who currently is 97 years old. So it, it tells you a lot of the seriousness. I mean, I, I mean Bob Dole is a, is a good man, and don't get me wrong, I nothing but respect for him, but. Uh, he's at 97, he's probably not at the top of his game. Mm -hmm. There's no Armenian lobbying firms, there's no Armenian organizations. Mm -hmm. And the two primary ones are the, uh, the Armenian Assembly and the Armenian National Committee, which is tied to the ARF, it's uh, uh -huh. uh, But those are not lobbying groups. They're, in, they're organizations that lobby for Armenian causes and interests. Uh, and they've had different focuses over the years and they've had different levels of effectiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, again, I think they do the best they can with the resources that they have. I just don't, uh, but when it comes to the, what I call the moneyed aspects of lobbying, uh, they're not in the game. Uh, and it's, it's no fault of their own because it's a different kind of thing. And mm -hmm. it, that in some ways, that's more the responsibility of the Armenian government. And uh, even though the Armenian uh, diaspora, especially in the United States, really underperforms, uh, in comparison to what it could be, mm -hmm. because despite the fact that, you know, we've had Armenians living in Armenia for a hundred years, they don't, uh, the fact that we are not using professional lobbyists and raising money to go that route tells you that we're sort of behind the times in our effectiveness. Um, what are the principles that the Armenian lobbying approach should follow to be successful and able to compete with a very well-funded and omnipresent Azerbaijani lobbying and caviar diplomacy? I think you need to be, listen, any kind of a, any kind of a lobbying campaign or any campaign is actually, you're telling a story. Uh, I need to tell an effective story. You need to tell a targeted story. Uh, I, I think the, you know, you can parcel up the, the, the Armenian narrative into different aspects of American politics or even different aspects of European politics. Uh, for example, one of the driving forces of the Republican Party, if not the primary driving force at this point at a grassroots level is the religious right. And uh, Armenian institutions and organizations have done absolutely nothing to use uh, this very strong Christian right organizations in their favor. And when all of these Christian right organizations spend all the time lobbying for Israel 
and other things which are not directly involve Christians. And now there's some historical issues about fundamentalist Christians and Protestants with, with Armenian Christianity, but at the end of the day, we should have a lot more common with them than not. And the other thing which is somewhat unknown is that uh, Armenians have always been very overrepresented in, in American evangelical ranks. You know, the most prominent, uh, prominent Trump supporter and evangelical leader in the United States is Billy Graham. Uh, uh, actually, Billy Graham's son, uh, Billy Graham's passed away, but uh, his brother-in-law is Armenian, and Armenians have always been very active in the Christian right circles, and we have not effectively used them on that front. Uh, and uh, I think we all saw how Trump, how responsive he was to the religious right, and if we had that card to play, we would have had better results in getting U.S. engagement during this war. Uh, while on the other hand, you know, you have on the more progressive front, you have this whole human rights, uh, self-determination angle that, uh, that is a great story to tell as far as, and lastly, you know, uh, uh, Aleyev is like a, he's a, he's a villain out of central casting. Uh, the things that he says, the, you know, the racist, almost neo-fascist statements that he routinely makes. You know, they should be, and which, by the way, he translates into his English site and he puts it out himself. You don't even have to translate it. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a guy that can be made into a cardboard villain very quickly. And we have not done that. And you need to, it's always easier to hate an individual than it is to get into the middle of some complicated conflict where everyone, for every A, there's a B. Mm -hmm. uh, your narrative needs to be much simpler and needs to be focused on what, what you need to say and in terms that people understand. And then and, and the other thing is you have to, you can't fight people's biases, but you can play along with them. Uh, it's very easy to convince Easterner, uh, Westerners of, a, of an Oriental despot mm -hmm. because that's what they expect. So there's Aleyev plays this statesman tolerance guy in the West and he plays a neo-fascist in his own circles. Well, you just take his words and uh, make him pay the price for it because he's a cardboard villain. And we have not done that. Uh, it's a lot easier to vilify him than it is to vilify Azerbaijan. Right now, he represents Azerbaijan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's one and the same. I mean, he owns the country, so it's one and the same. <laughs> there is a huge gap, um, ideological and political also gap, between the Armenians from the diaspora and the Armenians from the Republic of Armenia. And it has become more visible right after the signature of the deal ending the Second Nagorno-Karabakh War. And now when we have a very tense domestic political environment, where do you think that detachment from the local reality comes from? We have to be very careful. Uh, I, I don't know how. We, we can exaggerate the detachment uh, because obviously we don't want to give the impression that everyone who's upset about the deal is in the diaspora and everyone here is you know, fine to go along with it. It's absolutely not true. Mm -hmm. There are many people who are, almost everyone is upset about the outcome of the war. No one's happy about it. It's just a question of how you respond to it. Uh, I think what we've seen in the diaspora, and, and, and the diaspora, which is you know the largest diaspora, I mean, I shouldn't say the largest diaspora, the largest, the largest diaspora is in Russia, but the, the, the largest Western diaspora, which is in the United States, from everything that I get from them on a daily basis has essentially, to a great extent, gone crazy uh, as far as the reaction that, that they get. Their impression of what's going on here is far more drastic than it is because part of it is because the TV networks and things that broadcast from here there are all controlled by the opposition. So they'll turn every 500 person demonstration like the country is falling apart. So, uh, and then they have these uh, just there's, there's a tremendous level of misinformation, some of it uh, uh, intentional, pushed by certain forces here and certain forces abroad for their own reasons. Uh, these are Armenian political actors. But so uh, I think that dichotomy, I mean, that difference is there. Uh, but I think people here are far more grounded into, into reality, even though that reality is not a favorable one and they're not happy about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that the diaspora is, uh, especially the American diaspora, is most uh, detached from reality about what's really going on and uh, follow. I don't want to excite I don't want to generalize, but I mean, there are obviously a lot of level-headed people, but, you know, it's, it, I, they, they, 
the sort of the fake news stuff that I get from there is uh, some of it is almost laughable and I don't even want to repeat it because there's enough garbage out there and I don't want to put it out there but uh, I could write a book about the, e the emails or the Facebook messages I get every day with different uh, kind of idiotic things that somebody puts out there and you know, there's been studies done on on, the, on on social media. You know, negative news passes. You know, you know, gets forwarded three times faster than positive news. And there's there's not much room for nuance. Mm -hmm. That's the key. Uh, at the end of the day, you have to ground yourself in reality, uh, and you don't need to be Pollyannish about it. But you have to look at it uh, uh, with non-romantic eyes. Mm -hmm. Small countries like ours can't afford romantic politics. So you have to be very grounded in reality, but you should be resolute. You shouldn't blink. You should be strong, but uh, you need to be, you need to be as radical as the reality itself. Especially in our region. Yeah. Um, over the decades, the Armenian diaspora, and particularly the one in the US, has always had its own agenda separate from the official Armenian foreign policy objectives. Mm -hmm. It has been extensively focusing on their efforts on the Armenian genocide awareness. Mm -hmm. Do you think that if those efforts have been coordinated with the Armenian government and diversified years ago, Armenia would have a different political standing abroad? Well, uh, I'm exceptionally critical of uh, the Armenian foreign policy establishment because frankly on some level it doesn't even exist because there's no political what we found in this war is that you know the war starts and we have uh, unimaginative diplomats that you know can't don't have the basics of even the region that that you're that they're living in mm -hmm. they don't have the basic relationships our country was entirely isolated and so we've had a diplomatic fail for many years for a decade plus you know the last really good foreign minister that we had was Vartan Oskanyan, who was a worldly figure. Everything else has been just visionless since then. So I wouldn't even, uh, I wouldn't even know what advice they would give to diaspora organizations that would be of any use because they would not, if they, if they can't handle the most basic of things locally, what advice are they going to give in another country that they don't even clearly understand? Now, one can be critical of the diaspora institutions about being too obsessive about the genocide issue. And I think there's a fair case to be made with that. But at the end of the day, if that's what a certain or a significant number of diasporans care about, those organizations are going to be responsive to that. Now, some of it is driven by them. Mm -hmm. And the diaspora issue, I mean, the genocide issue is obviously very complicated because I think it's also... It, it, it has these functions of preserving identity in the diaspora. So it's a different kind of thing. I don't want to be too critical of it, mm -hmm. but would we have been better off to be more focused on the Artsakh issue than on genocide? Probably, uh, because, you know, that involves the, the lives of people today. Uh, so, I mean, but that's a whole other discussion. I don't want to get into it, but I, I think... I, I wouldn't trust a, whatever the whatever the Armenian government would wanted to tell them. One, I don't know if they would listen, and two, I don't know if they had the wherewithal to even give them proper guidance about what they should be focused on. Because, as we have seen, uh, our foreign policy does not have that kind of vision. Uh, we have seen during the war that the, uh, like for example, Anka has had considerable success regarding the um, contact with the companies who were providing some some parts to the Turkish drones. Mm -hmm. Can you name any um, other considerably important accomplishments that the Armenian diaspora has achieved during the Second Nagorno-Karabakh War? No. I mean, I, I, this brings me no joy to say it, but uh, as a political collective, we entirely failed. Uh, all of our institutions proved to be mediocre, both in Armenia and in the diaspora. All of our institutions proved to be unimaginative. All of our institutions proved to be visionless. Uh, and uh, they were not up to par. And that's why we failed. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that that uh, companies are... Uh, Especially, you know, especially, especially since so many of these places were in California or the West Coast, it was easy to pressure them. Uh, but uh, as a as a as a general, you know, what did we accomplish? Listen, a lot of good people came here and did a lot of good things, uh, or people tried to do a lot of things. 
you know, uh, people were, you know, really pushing the boundaries of their activism, which was very, you know, great to see. Uh, I'm not, uh, this is not about questioning uh, the motivation or the willingness of people to engage and do things. It's a question of effectiveness. But as far as effectiveness goes, no, uh, we, we, we failed. We failed on that front. You have referred to the West indifference in Nagorno-Karabakh war as a harsh education mm -hmm. previously. It is undeniable that a narrative the, the West won't let Azerbaijan to escalate the conflict further has been prevailing for many years in the Armenian mm -hmm. politics. Mm -hmm. And that myth has been busted quite quickly during Nagorno-Karabakh war. Have we been overestimating our importance um, uh, our importance to the West, or this aloof response to the war uh, has been surprising for everyone? Uh, yeah, I, I think we've, we've exaggerated our importance overall. We've obviously exaggerated our importance to the West. Uh, we just need to understand where we are in the pecking order of the world, and uh, we don't count. Uh, and the reason we don't count is because we haven't done anything to make us count. So we can be very critical of, you know, you know how you know, they, they, the same way, you know, in 1915 they failed and the world looked the other way, this time the world, well, I mean, true. Uh, in the context of a, of a moral political order, that's absolutely true. And you have to drive home that point because obviously not all of politics is cynical power politics. There's a lot of institutions, organizations, individuals that don't operate like that. So you need to engage them and activate them. But uh, what they told us is uh, your lives don't matter. Uh, but then why would we think our lives matter? I was just reading today, 85,000 people have starved to death in Yemen. And that's even 10 times less justified of a war. It doesn't even make any sense. If it wasn't for the US British rearming of the UAE and the Saudi Arabia, that war wouldn't even continue. They even refuel for their bombing raids uh, to essentially destroy the poorest country in the world. So in the eyes of power brokers in Germany or France or the United States, where Yemeni, Armenian, Senegalese, El Sal you know, Salvadoran, uh, you're on that level. It's, uh, it's, it's not a just moral universe, but we know where we stand with them and you either toughen up and uh, strengthen yourself mm -hmm. or uh, you're going to be dealing with the same situation because they don't care if we live or die. They do not care if we live or die. We need to understand that. We need to embrace it and we need to act upon that. Um, I've done my small research uh, about the media coverage of the diaspora protests, especially in the US and in general abroad. And I found out that the coverage has been mostly about the violence or provocations that occurred during those protests, for example, mm -hmm. between um, Azerbaijan and the Armenian mm -hmm. community, or for example, about local residents' dissatisfaction with the Armenians walking the roads in their cities. Mm -hmm. um, the name Nagorno-Karabakh has been barely mentioned in the news reports. It was about a, a like they were referring to the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan very mm -hmm. vaguely. Mm -hmm. um, do you think it's just laziness of the American media or journalists, or it's a deliberate avoidance of putting the topic under the spotlight? Well, part of it is, uh, if you know anything about the media, you know there's, there's a phrase in American media, they say, if it bleeds, it leads. So you can have, and then you can, you can have an anti-war demonstration in which 150,000 people march in the street and nothing happens. And if three people get into a fight, that will be the lead story. So some of it is what the media does. The other part of it is that there's this, uh, almost this inherent bias in the Western media, uh, against people who look like us, uh, because we don't fit into the victim narrative. Uh, we're not Muslims. Uh, uh, we, we, we look white. Uh, we're Christians. So obviously you have to be the oppressor. So we don't fit into the normal categories of victimhood. You know, we're not Somalis. We're not Kosovars. We're not Rohingya. Uh, uh, we're not being suppressed by China and, uh, uh, and we're not a Uyghur, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, there's this inherent Western bias against what I call the Christians of the East. And I think that's there. It's almost literally, you can go back a thousand years of this and it's there. And then there's also this other, and we have to not shy away from this. There's also this racist attitude where and you see it, especially in the English language press, where it's like, oh, it's just, you know, little, little brown people fighting each other. 
why can't they be civilized like the Finns and the Swedes and you know, uh, you know, why can't you go on? What's wrong with Arabic being under Azeri control after all there are, you know, that, you know, Hungarians that live in Romania, uh, like it's the same, you know, uh, they have no concept that, uh, what that would mean. So, uh, part of it is, is just your basic racism of the Western press corps. And part of it is this very inherent, uh, bias, uh, against, uh, the Christians of the East, and that's real. I mean, it's, you see that in the language that's used. The, the things, for example, that uh, Aleyev did in Karabakh pale in comparison to the stuff that Milosevic did in Kosovo. Pales! You know, in Kosovo, it was horrible, but they put people on trains and they send them away. They were not, you know, dropping white phosphorus or cluster bombs into cities. And for that, all of NATO, you know, got together to destroy Serbia or at, at that point, Yugoslavia, and bombed them for like 70 days. So uh, uh, we don't fit the, the victim category. Uh, and uh, they think we're just a bunch of brown people that should grow up. That's really sad to hear. <laughs> I was hoping for a more optimistic response, but they're just lazy. You're, you're, you're talking <laughs> to the wrong person. <laughs> Um, getting back to the Armenian diaspora topic, the diaspora often feels like uh, feels upset thinking that the Armenians in the Republic consider them only a, as cash cows, uh, quote unquote. Um, it never really gives them a chance to participate in the decision making locally or engage in other initiatives. Is there any truth behind this reasoning? Has there been a lack of support of the Armenian government to actually engage constructively and more long term with the diasporans? or lack of the willingness of the diasporans to visit Armenia other than for touristic purposes? Well, let me ask you something. Is there anything that the Armenian government has done in the last 30 years that is based on long-term planning or approaching this in some sophisticated fashion? Uh, hardly anything, okay? Yeah. So why would relationships with the diaspora be any different? So this is a bit of, uh, it's a good expectation, but you have to live in the real world. If you have a state that is failing on all fronts, you have generals that for 12 years never think that drones are going to be important. What makes you think the same government is going to think about creative ways of reaching to the diaspora? So I think this is the, that's a bit of a, uh, it's, it's a bit of a giving, expecting too much from what is, uh, you know, our mediocre failed institutions here. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, so obviously, the, the Armenian state has not done a good job of engaging the diaspora because the potential is far greater than it is. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the diaspora itself has underperformed. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a two-way streak. Uh, Can you go further in, into that? Absolutely. Uh, uh, people think the diaspora sends a lot of money here. The diaspora doesn't send a lot of money here. There's a lot of people who do a lot of good work here. On an average year, Armenia Fund raises 10 to $20 million, and that's like the biggest thing, the biggest organization that raises money for things in Armenia. And there's a lot of individual great people who do great work, and I don't want to take away from that, and, and I don't want to downgrade what they do. You look at the Eye Care Project and multiple institutions. Look at TUMO. You know, there's, there's, exceptions, to, there's exceptions to that, and there's exceptional things. Mm -hmm. However, systematically, it isn't there. Uh, on an average year, Armenia Fund raises about probably $20 million. Uh, and I will guarantee you that's how much on a weekend Southern California Armenians lose in Las Vegas. Every weekend, there's probably 2,000 Armenians from Southern California and Vegas, $1,000 each, that's $20 million. So, uh, and you have to look and compare ourselves to other organizations. I remember reading this very interesting report of the Lebanese Shia diaspora, which is far smaller and far poorer than our diaspora. It's essentially you know, people that own shops in Paraguay and Africa and like grocers and, you know, it's, these are not nothing compared to the wealth that our diaspora has. And the estimate was that on a yearly basis, the Shia diaspora sends a quarter billion dollars a year to Hezbollah for their uh, non-military, for their social services. And we have nothing compared to that. So uh, diaspora itself underperforms. Diaspora institutions have not caught up with the fact that Armenia is an independent state. They uh, they still act like uh, uh, 
there's a social club of Burbank or Tehran or Lebanon or, or, or Beirut or something. You need to build a state. Building a state is expensive. It requires far greater commitment and far more serious people involved in, uh, in creating those networks. Uh, we have probably some of the finest doctors in the world working as specialists all around the world. And, and all of them collectively have not yet to build a single world-class hospital in Armenia. We have some of the finest academics in the world. Well, we do not have a single university here that's the top 500 in the world. So the diaspora itself has failed Armenia. Armenia has failed the diaspora, but the Armenian, but the diaspora has failed Armenia because its, its role and the amount of its commitment is uh, exaggerated and marginal. And people need to understand, you know, it's not, you have to move from charity to development mm -hmm. and you need to build a state. Is there a single decent think tank in Armenia that focuses on foreign policy? How easy would that be to set up? How easy would this have been set up 20 years ago? So uh, the diaspora needs to start thinking in the context of building a state. You need to get engaged in building a state not this project here, that project there, as worthy as those projects are. And I'm not, again, there are great people who do great work. And, I don't, and this is not about that. This is about a lack of systematic approach. So it's a two-way streak. And uh, we should be tired of everyone's statements about it because uh, you either act or you, you know, shut up. How do you see the future development of the Armenian diaspora grassroots activism in the post-war space? Well, I mean, uh, the one good thing is that this war has done is activated a lot more people. And, and it activated, and I've seen, I see this myself, activated a whole generation of, uh, of young people who weren't even uh, care or aware of anything Armenian. So there's a much bigger audience of people that follow and are willing to get engaged. So, uh, your base of activists and your base of people who are uh, willing to do things has grown dramatically. So the issue becomes, you know, what do you what do you go after? Uh, and I think in the short run, outside of them engaging in specific things in Armenia, whether that's charitable or preferably business or job creation, things of that nature, uh, in the diaspora, it's really about. Uh, using Azerbaijan's actions in the war to prosecute them in the eyes of the, of the world mm -hmm. and to push for things like remedial secession, ideas of like recognition with rights, that essentially the way Azerbaijan conducted the war essentially nullifies any rights they have to ever rule over the Armenians of Artsakh mm -hmm. uh, because of their, uh, I mean, it's given the fact that remedial secession was used in Kosovo, and the actions of the Azeri regime were far more criminal than the actions of Slobodan Milosevic. Uh, we should have a campaign that's focused on uh, remedial secession and the removal of uh, Artsakh from the control and uh, the territory of Azerbaijan. Mm -hmm. That's what the focus should be. What are the three key steps that the Armenian government, whoever that may be in the next year um, or in the near future, should undertake to effectively engage with the diaspora and to guide or direct their activism abroad to make it a powerful lobbying asset adapted to the current foreign policy necessities? Well, I, I don't know. I don't know if they're, I don't know if they're capable of it, first of all. Uh, second of all, on some level, I don't know if they really should, because I, I think the, uh, the way these things work is diasporans are essentially citizens of a foreign country also, for the most part. So they should act as citizens of a foreign country to demand things from their own country. Uh, and I think the, it, and they can also demand things from their current governments uh, that are, you know, they can, they can have maximalist demands. Mm -hmm. And those maximalist demands create room for the Armenian government to have better outcomes uh, in demands that aren't maximalist. So on some level, you don't, you want to engage them directionally, but you don't necessarily want them to say, okay, you go do this, this and this and this and this. So uh, as long as everyone's moving in the same direction, I don't know how much coordination you need, but I think it serves the interest of the Armenian government for the diaspora to ask for maximalist things, mm -hmm. to give itself room uh, to uh, negotiate. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, it's not a one, two, three, but I don't see them being able to direct anything like this anyway.
even if you wanted to. What advice would you give to the young diasporans? Is it better to come here and do something here or to stay there and try to help the country from whatever they point they are in? It's always better to come here. Always better to come here. Because uh, one, this is where it really matters. Two, the nature of Hayastan and the fact that it's very small means that you can have tremendous impact here. Uh, this is one of those cases where a small number of dedicated people actually can make a tremendous difference. Mm -hmm. uh, people think it takes, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people to do anything. That's actually not true. There's, uh, there's actually case study in political science in which you can literally overthrow any government. And obviously we're not talking about overthrowing any government. It's just an example. Mm -hmm. You can overthrow any government if 3% of the population is willing to engage in activities. 3% of people are willing to go block the road and engage saying, I'm not going to rest until this government is gone. That government will be gone. It could be Hosni Mubarak or it could be North Korea. There's just ample proof of this. It takes a small number of people to change things. There's this notion that you know, you're going to have to have hundreds of thousands of people engaged. No, no, no. You need a small cadre of people that are dedicated to very specific things. Mm -hmm. So it's always better to be here. If you can't always be here, you want to be here and not be here. So you're always engaged in things here. Uh, and frankly, in today's world, with the communication technology that we have, that's easy to do. Uh, and especially now with COVID in the Zoom world, you know, it's very easy to be active in a thousand places. So come here. If you can't come here, be, you know, come here part of the time. If you can't come here part of the time, be engaged with something very specific. And everything that you're engaged in has to, has to be focused on one thing and one thing alone, which is excellence. Because the one thing that needs to be driven out of our system is mediocrity. Uh, this is not a country that can afford mediocrity. The only thing we should do is excellence, which means you got to get rid of a couple of ideas and phrases mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, Mepan Konank will do something. No, no, no. You either know what you're doing or you don't know. And the most dangerous word in Armenia, which is Githam, which is I know, which is the, it's the moment you know someone doesn't know anything when they tell you they know something. Uh, and by far the most ex the most dangerous word in Armenia, which is uh, Masnaget, which is expert. <laughs> the moment someone says Masnaget, you, you, you're probably dealing with an idiot. So uh, focus on excellence because that's where it's at. We have pockets of excellence here. You need to double down on those pockets of excellence. And we even have a rule with some of my friends here is that anybody here now comes to us with anything that's mediocre, you throw it back in their face and you come back with something better. I'm not going to put up with this. Uh, we need to get better in everything. We need to be humble. We need to understand what our failures are. We should not be despairing whatsoever. There's so much going for this country and this culture, which we don't appreciate uh, because we don't think in those terms. Uh, but we need to impose our will on our problems. And you can only do that by not tolerating mediocrity or half-ass work. You either do something well or you don't do it. And if people don't know something, they should be told. Mm -hmm. And it's not about niceties. Mm -hmm. It's about effectiveness. Someone said that we actually need to learn to learn. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe that's a, a fault in our culture. Um, but I couldn't agree more. And hopefully they, our generation will be more persistent. And uh... I think, listen, I think this, this, you said a key word, because generation, because, you know, uh, one of the issues with Armenia, and this is real, and this could be also the case in other countries or the region. There's three generations of people in Armenia. Uh, it's uh, the under 30, it's the 30 to 60, and the 60 to above. 60 to above is the homo sovieticos, who just because of time and age have really left the scene mm -hmm. for the most part. They're either retired or about to retire. And these are people who lived through the Soviet age as their primary years. And with nostalgia. With, some with nostalgia, most with nostalgia, you know, uh, and, and some of them are quite effective people still, you know, people who are well-educated and some of them are exceptionally well-educated. In fact, they're far better educated in the generation that came after them. Mm -hmm. Then you have the 30 to 60 crowd, which is essentially the people in power now. Uh, of whom the best of their generation are not in Armenia. 
They're running a, a travel agency in Lyon. They're running a bank in Los Angeles. They're, they have a startup in New York. And that world, uh, and that's also the generation that felt the worst of the pre and the post-Soviet collapse, which means they didn't have a proper education. Mm -hmm. They didn't have opportunities that the current generation has. And they're sort of, you know, you know, not to fault of their own, they, they just don't have all of the skills and, and they're also not the best of their generation because the best of their generation is not here. And then you have the under 30 crowd, which is a completely different thing. The under 30 crowd in Armenia and the top 20, 25% of the uh, under 30 crowd, which is frankly the only people that matter, it's the top people in any category that matter, are top, are world class. They can compete with anyone anywhere. And a lot of our issues will be dealt with once they come to power because they don't, they don't have a hang up. So their parents or their grandparents, they're far more worldly. You know, they have their, they're not sometimes as worldly as they should be, but their capabilities are world class. So you have this generational thing that's very, and you know, it's also very telling. And I've talked about this in one of my interviews is, uh, you know, this, this silly opposition that we have, the street opposition, you know, they, you know, 17 political parties, which is a joke anyway, in a country of 3 million people, you know, they put all their heads together and they're the person they nominate for prime minister is 75 years old, who hasn't been in office since 1992. Mm -hmm. it, it'll be like the French, the French going and digging up Mitterrand to bring him back to run the country. So uh, it tells you about the generational divide of what's what and how out of touch some, some people here are. Mm -hmm. But uh, the best and the brightest in this country now are under 30. And uh, I think when when they come to power with uh, experience, I think they're going to do great things on all kinds of fields. Uh, I've been very negative about this, my assessments, but uh, anybody who's pessimistic about this country, even at this stage, really doesn't know what's going on in the world because the world is in a transformative period in which everything that we know is going to change over the next 20 years. And we have advantages over other people, which are cultural in nature. You know, uh, we don't have identity issues. The things that are tearing apart the Western world are, you know, what does it mean to be a Frenchman? What does it mean to be an American? Uh, these cultural wars that don't exist here. Everybody knows who they are and where they came from. So we have advantages that we don't realize. And they're cultural in nature. And, you know, there's a lot of countries that actually rebuilt their entire country and economies by using culture, like Denmark and places like that. So we need to be harshly looking at our realities and our problems, but we should not be pessimistic for a second. Thank you very much for a positive end to a quite dark <laughs> um, interview. And uh, we'll follow the developments and see what the 2021 will bring. Thank you very much.